One pleasant evening while waiting for a cup of tea, I was thinking about ideas for my next project. I had a few but one particularly stood out to me. To control an object's movement using audio frequencies. This particular scene from the Guardians of Galaxy was the inspiration behind the entire idea. I was so impressed by the meticulous and graceful movements of the arrow being controlled just by whistling. Initially, the idea of recreating the Yaka arrow seemed great, but then I grew a bit reluctant to move forward. This was primarily because such an idea had already been executed and that too in real life and also because I wasn't all that knowledgeable when it came to audio domain programming. But I told myself, why not learn something new, because at the end of the day, how hard can it actually be? Oh, and there was my tea. According to various fandoms online, the Yaka arrow is created using a rare element called Yaka. This element is reacted to certain high octave frequencies which Yondu is so skillful at controlling, thus the complex and graceful movements. Other than this, we get no further information on how certain frequencies affect the movement of the object. And the relationship between the input and the output is left to us to speculate. I first thought about mapping a certain frequency range to a vector 3 movement. This would be the most realistic approach given the limited amount of information, but also the one that yields the highest number of possible outcomes. Because if you dictate what movements a certain frequency range is allowed to make, we are essentially telling the audio signal to make its own rules about the movement patterns. And that quite certainly would be an advantage, but unfortunately it also carries some big drawbacks. We wouldn't know which whistling sounds create which movement patterns, and also, the audio signal itself isn't guaranteed to be pleasing to the ear. But the biggest downside of it all is that there's no guarantee that I'd be able to whistle in a way that predictably moves the arrow. So I came up with another plan. Since we do not have a solid understanding of how the whistle affects the arrow, why not simplify the process by introducing a command system? A certain whistling sound will command the arrow to perform a certain action. This gives us more control and because of that we can make the input and output as desirable and as complex as it can be. So that was my plan. An audio signal works as an input and it triggers certain functions. Pretty simple right? Well, not really. If there's one thing that I wanted to accomplish with this project, that would be to implement a real-time audio processing system. You whistle in runtime and the arrow moves in runtime, just like in the movie. Unfortunately for me, real-time audio processing or audio processing in general is a pretty difficult domain. And that's why I've been avoiding it since I made my circular spectrogram. But this time I was determined to learn and conquer at least the basics of this field. So. That's where I started. I had two fundamental questions for this project. How does the computer know what a whistling sound is? And how do we tell the computer to make distinctions between any two whistling sounds? The basic approach like the one you see in Jake Laser's video is to simply define a threshold frequency. See the graph changes based on the pitch I do. If the whistling sound is higher or equal to the specified frequency, it is classified as command 1. If it is below or equal to a second specified frequency, it becomes command 2. And lastly, if the sound is out of the frequency range, it becomes noise. Even though this is a plausible approach to my problem, it comes with some serious constraints. One of which is that it only works for monotone frequencies. So if you were to whistle with any musical intent, only the frequencies defined to get recognized get recognized, not the signal as a whole. If we had to solve this problem with the same approach, we'd have to define every single frequency within a certain audio signal. Which brings us to the other problem. Even if the order of these frequencies are different from what we want to classify, 
they'll still be classified as our audio signal. Sure, there are workarounds for this, but this solution just wasn't suited for my project. In order to recognize audio signals as a whole, instead of just its frequency components, I decided to settle on audio classification algorithms. Audio classification is used to classify audio signals based on what's called their features. These features serve as a kind of fingerprint or a unique signature for any given sound. One of the popular means of extracting these features is to use MFCC or Mel Frequency Sepstral Coefficients. MFCCs are meant to extract the human perceivable qualities of a sound. So even if a melody is being played on two different instruments, the program will still be able to recognize the melody as being under the same class. This is important because in the real world, there's no guarantee that the sounds we want to classify will always be the exact replica of one another. Armed with the new knowledge, I roughly planned out my pipeline. First, I was going to use an audio classification algorithm to classify whistles into three different classes. Kill, Blast and Silence. Then I'll take the return value of this classification to execute one of two commands, Kill or Blast. I initially planned for all of this to be executed within C Sharp and Unity, but as you'll see in just a minute, the pipeline had some other plans. I began by testing an audio fingerprinting library that I found on GitHub. This library does exactly what its name suggests. It cross-checks fingerprints of a given audio file against the ones it has already extracted. So I started by giving it an audio file to serve as my definition. Then once its features were extracted and saved, I tested by giving it the same audio file, this time as the input to classify. And it worked. It worked accurately across a wide variety of audio files. However, this accuracy only shined if the audio to classify was exactly the same as the training data or just slightly pitched down. If the audio signal had some major changes or distortions, the algorithm fails to classify. I wasn't all that disappointed because from the get-go, I knew it couldn't reliably perform real-time classification with comparing features against just one file. Since all of the previous methods either failed or gave undesirable results, I finally moved towards the popular AI techniques, specifically deep learning models. The main advantage of using deep learning to classify audio is that it's good at generalizing audio features. It's not strictly limited to one or two features, but rather learns to predict what a given feature might be. This works for me because in real life, my whistles may be noisy, have distortions and artifacts, but the algorithm may still be able to accurately predict these sounds. So I got my feet wet by using a pre-trained audio classification model called Yamnet. I settled on this model from the various others because it was trained on a relatively big dataset and could accurately predict 521 classes. Setting up Yamnet wasn't all that hard and during testing, it predicted sounds with decent accuracy. I think now would be the right time to point out that all of this was done in Python. At the time, I was too busy getting a working model set up, I had completely forgotten about my pipeline requirements. By the time I realized this, I decided to keep going and implement a real-time feature into the model as well. Now even though I had Yamnet set up, I didn't actually have an audio classification model for my specific needs. You see, even though Yamnet can identify 521 different classes, the whistles I wanted to classify wasn't one of them. Yamnet did have a whistle class, but it cannot differentiate between whistles. So I somehow had to add my own custom whistle dataset into the already pre-trained model. I did this by using transfer learning. Transfer learning is a method to use an already trained model as a starting point in creating a second model to predict a second task. In my case, this second task was to identify two distinct whistle sounds. The advantage of this method is that since we are not starting from zero, we don't need a heavy dataset for the second classification. So I got to work. I started by recording about 100 samples for each whistle in Audacity. In retrospect, I wish I had recorded these samples in different environments with varying quality. 
since it affected my model's results afterwards. For the rest, I just followed the guide on TensorFlow's website and got the CSV and dataset ready for training. The training process was quite quick and not before long, I had my very own audio classification model ready to be deployed. I recorded some test samples and to my surprise, the model predicted every single one of them. Now that I had an audio classification model in hand, it was finally time to add the real-time feature. This sounds way easier than it should and I was confronted by the hard truth. You see, when I started searching the internet for answers, I didn't get a lot of information. And the ones that I did get were either way too complicated or didn't explain the process completely. Since you could imagine I couldn't get any further with just this information. I felt like my week's worth of work meant nothing and that I should just stop and not waste any more time. But I didn't. While I was thinking about a potential solution, I remembered something about YAMNet processing the data X amount at a time. Internally, the model extracts frames from the audio signal and processes batches of these frames. This version of the model uses frames that are 0.96 seconds long and extracts one frame every 0.48 seconds. In audio processing, we process a signal in terms of what's called frames. Each frame contains n samples and the signal is processed one frame at a time. Now, this isn't anything new but the fact that the signal was processed sequentially gave me an idea. Why not use chunks of the live audio as the input for classification? Typically, we only record chunks of a live audio feed because audio signals in real life are continuous which means they have infinite resolution. But computers cannot afford to have an infinite amount of anything, so we turn the signals into discrete samples which means for every second we store n samples of the signal. So anyway, the idea I had was solid so I started to implement it. I used Pi Audio to create an audio stream and set the chunk of frame size to 4096 samples. Then I took these samples and turned them into a one-dimensional flow tensor and passed it into the model for classification. And the moment of truth. It works. Well, somewhat. Now all of a sudden, the model was classifying the sounds very poorly. It still works with near 100% accuracy in recorded files but fails in real time. Specifically with differentiating between whistle sounds. I'm still not certain about the exact problem but after a bit of experimenting, I think I might have found the reason. You see, during training, I supplied the model with audio files with their entire duration. But in real time, I'm only providing chunks of these audio signals. Now, this won't be a problem if the sounds you're trying to classify are very distinct, like you see with the silence class. But since the other two signals are very similar, throughout their lifetime, they may share similar features. I think a way to solve this would be to add more data with more variation in the duration. But I didn't want to record 200 more samples, so I just followed on the second step. I went back to Audacity and exported the same samples, but this time taking into account the starting, middle and end points. After retraining the model with the updated dataset, it was doing much better. Although not nearly as accurate as static wave files, I felt like it was more than enough for this project, so I moved on. It was finally time to implement all of this in Unity. But as you know, the audio classification was done in Python and Unity uses c -sharp. How was I going to work with this limitation? Well, first I tried to use Unity's Barracuda plugin, which allows you to use machine learning models inside of Unity. But that ended up being a complete disaster. So instead I settled for a more indirect approach, creating a communication between Unity and Python. Luckily for me, there wasn't much to do, because I found this script online that establishes a connection between C Sharp and Python using sockets. 
Adding a button to initialize the recording was the only change I made to the script. Then in Jupyter Notebook, I made a separate cell to check if the button inside of Unity was pressed. I did this by sending a zero to Python from C Sharp. If it was pressed, then the recording inside Python began. And during runtime, Python sends back the predicted class to Unity. Now for the fun part, adding the arrow. I used this neat arrow model that I found on Sketchfab. In order for the player to hold the arrow, I made it a child of the first person camera. Next, I had to make two primary functions, kill and blast. I had some cool moves that I wanted to make in my head. For the kill function, I wanted the arrow to shoot towards something and return to the player. This was to emulate the return sequence you see in the movie. To move towards a point, I used the lerp function which required a starting and an endpoint. The starting point was the default position of the arrow and the endpoint was taken a certain distance away in the camera direction. Doing this we get a smooth straight movement towards a given point. Next for the return sequence. I didn't want this to be too pale but nothing too complicated as well. So I tried to make a curve as the arrow returned back to its position. I did this by using Bezier curves. I manually added two game objects as children of the arrow to serve as the control points for the curve. And this is the Bezier function that I'm using. It takes in two arguments, a list of control points and time t, and returns an interpolated point at time t. I also made some simple boolean logic to trigger the return sequence after the arrow had reached its end point. Now once we shoot the arrow, this is what we get. I don't know about you but this already looks beautiful. As for the blast function, it was pretty simple. I simply set up a boolean logic to check if is blast was active during the first movement of the arrow. If it was, then play an explosion at the point of contact and remove the exploding object. This was done with the help of rigid bodies and colliders. After this set the is returning boolean to false, so the arrow doesn't return to the player, but simply spawns back in hand. This is what it looks like. Pretty neat huh? For the finale, it was simply a matter of using the mic input to activate and deactivate the various booleans. So in the connection script, I made a reference to all the necessary variables and changed their values according to the classification. And alas, it was finally complete. It was so satisfying to watch a weapon respond to my whistles in real time. Now before I go, I want to point some things out. This is if anything just a prototype to test out my theories. Yes, the whistling does control the arrow, but it's very unrefined and not very user friendly at the moment. If I were to implement this into a game, it'll take way longer since I have to account for variations in everybody's whistles. Which brings me to the other problem. As you might have seen, the model isn't very good at differentiating between whistles. About 50% of the time, the whistles were classified wrong. As I mentioned earlier, this might be because of the imbalance and the lack of more robust samples in the dataset. But all in all, the pipeline does work. So take this video with a grain of salt or maybe use it as a blueprint to build your own Yaka Arrow. With that said, I had so much fun working on this project and I'm proud to have brought my ideas to reality. If you guys have any advice on how to improve it, do let me know in the comments below. So if you guys enjoyed the video, leave a like and consider subscribing. I'll see you in the next video.